Good morning. I'm doing something that I was originally not going to do, and that is like a mini instructional video about MIG welding. Um, largely, I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to sound all preachy like this is how a master does it or something like that, because I'm not a master, I'm a hobbyist at home just dicking around fixing up cars. But um, I think it will be of interest to some people. In fact, I know it will because the comments I've got, got um, and also my cousin Rob is just about to um, potentially embark on some welding of his own, whether he gets on with his XJS or whether he just has a play at home, I'm not sure. And also my mate Jason is interested. So I'm gonna introduce you first of all to my welder and tell you why I bought it, what it does, and um, why I've recommended it to other people. It's a Clark World MIG 160 TM. It's about 350 quid's worth, and I think it's one of the smaller welders you can get, which has an integral platform for taking the big gas bottles. I would definitely recommend getting one that takes big gas bottles, because the amount of money that you go through burning up the little, um, what are they, one, one and a half litre disposable bottles is absolutely crazy. You're much better off with one of these. Um, for example, that one is a 10 litre um, argon mix, and I'll go into the gases later, but it's 5% argon, the rest of it's CO2. And um, I think originally when you get the bottle, it's about 65 quid. After that, refills are 45 quid. Um, I've ordered that through a company called Adams Gas, which um, have stockists all over the country now. They're based in Kent, which is um, why I knew about them, because that's where I am, or was. Um, but since uh, they've started up, they've now got suppliers all over the place, so you shouldn't have any problems getting hold of the stuff. <clears throat> anyway, back to the welder. If you're completely new to welding, I'll talk through the basics. In here, you have your reel of MIG wire. In there is a little motor. When you pull the trigger, let me just grab that. <clears throat> that trigger just spins that motor, which clamps onto the wire and pushes it or pulls it all the way through the harness so that it comes out the end of the tip. The second feature, obviously, is the delivery of the gas. <coughs> gas is in the bottle. As you pull the trigger, you can hear a little valve, or I can. That is opening a little valve in here, which allows the gas to come through that cable. It actually gets fed through up the harness as well, and then comes out through little vent holes there. And the whole point of the gas is it shields your world. The gas in the bottle is inert, whereas oxygen in the environment um, will burn. So as well as you making the metal molten, you'll actually be burning it or impurities in and around the area because of the oxygen in the air. So having the shielding gas just means that that can't happen and you get a purer world. And then the third thing is your earth strap because what you're doing is you're connecting a circuit between the piece of metal you're welding at one end with the earth and the um, bit of wire that's coming out of the end and the electrical current that goes through basically acts like a fuse it's burning away but it's burning away at the same rate as you're feeding it more effectively fuse material from your roll of um, mig wire there's a few little things that are worth knowing about when you're setting up your welder. The first one is the um, tension on that um, roller and the tension on your reel. All the way through with welding, what you want is consistency and repeat repeatability. Because if you are having the wire, the wire come out of there at inconsistent rates, you'll get an inconsistent world. You'll, some, of you, some of them will be lovely, others will be horrible, and you'll be scratching your head wondering why. When you pull the trigger, 
wire comes out obviously. So each time that motor is pulling or rolling um, and dragging the wire off the reel. If you have not enough tension on there and quite a heavy reel of new wire, what can happen is you let go and the momentum of this carries on, it just free wheels and it all gathers and spins. And then the next time you pull the trigger, it's just behaving badly. It, you're not getting the same rate of wire coming out. So you want enough tension on that so that it doesn't free wheel under its own forward momentum, but you don't want it so tight that the little roller here can't drag it off and it's slipping. So it slips and grips, slips and grips. Um, so if I back that off, so I don't have enough clamping pressure, I think it's not gonna do it, but you get the idea. We're talking about extremes here. Yeah, that's actually still working. Shows that it's actually quite a good little welder. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, basically you want enough friction on that that it's reliably always getting wire to you at the same speed and enough tension on that so that it's not freewheeling like when you let go of the trigger but not so clamped up that that slips and spins and can't deliver the wire up the gun hopefully that makes sense with the gas i'll just turn it off you have the valve on your bottle which means that gas can now reach your regulator then on the regulator itself you have your um, feed adjustment it's quite tempting to open that up fully but you're just wasting gas what you want is the minimum amount on here to allow gas to come out and protect your weld but not excessive amounts so that you're just pushing gas out into the atmosphere that's not actually benefiting you very much when i first got uh, one of these gas bottles i didn't understand that and i had the black knob on the back screwed all the way in which was giving me maximum delivery of gas and i just pissed through a bottle in about a week and um, cost myself 60 quid i'll just show you or try and right the microphone's a bit better when this is taken out but you can hear that's the gas coming out. If I put this up here, what am I trying to achieve? Hopefully, in this shot, you'll be able to see me moving the knob and you can hear what's going on. So as I screw it in, you'll get more gas feed. Yeah. Back to a back to a breath really. I'll reset that once I'm actually welding so I know that I'm getting just enough um, gas to protect the world. In fact, why don't I do that now? Well, I've just closed the valve on the bottle altogether and evacuated all of the gas out of the out of the um, harness. So as I weld now. <clears throat> basically there will be no shielding gas whatsoever and you'll probably see a spitty farty horrible world so what we've got is loads of aero bar type weld lots of pockets of gas that have then blown up and have erupted as the gas expanded and pushed the molten metal apart so that is just not very good <coughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna weld again but progressively crack the um, gas feed open if i can See how the world became nicer as I put more gas through. Let's 
So we get in there now. <coughs> a little bit more. <sighs> nice, clean, even weld, no spatter. Um, so what you want to do is get to that stage and then back it off until basically you've got a breath of gas, which is shielding your weld, but you've not got so much that you're pushing gas out that's not really doing anything useful. Back chatting about the gas again. Um, it's argon mix and this is the 5% stuff. So it's about 95% argon. And then although it says it's 5% CO2, most of them are about 3% plus about 2% of oxygen. But um, the 5% argon mix is pretty much what everybody uses for car body metal work. CO2, like just straight CO2, is often referred to as pub gas. Um, and you can use that, but most of the time that's used on thicker metal. Thin metal really benefits from having the argon because it makes for a sort of cleaner weld, a lot less spattery. And there's something in the chemistry of the sort of resultant weld deposit you get with the argon mix um you you get a sort of slightly more um softer weld slightly more malleable and um uh, i think basically the, the co2 it says it gives it a colder weld or something and basically means it's harder weld deposit so um basically all hobbyists who are doing car body metal thin sheet stuff are going to be using five percent argon mix and that's what I recommend if you're out there looking for it. Um, all the way through this video, I'm doing my best to explain my understanding of stuff, but I accept I'm not an expert. So um, please feel free to comment down below. And also, um, if anyone knows of decent websites and articles or other videos, post links to it. So I'm going to do my best to explain things, but I'm not scripting this and I'm not kind of... Um, going through it in any particular order i'm just doing my best to explain what i know and my thoughts on it and then you are free to like then ignore that if you want or choose to follow it whatever the other thing that i've just realized is i didn't talk about um diameters of mig wire the two common sizes are 0.8 and 0.6 so i'm using 0.6 millimeter that's the diameter of the wire itself and you will have a corresponding diameter tip there so that the wire feed comes out. I think I'm actually using a 0.8 in there because I ran out of 0.6s and it'll still work, but probably would be better if I did have a 0.6 mil tip. The Obviously, the, the thinner the MIG wire, the less um, current you'll need to melt it and do your welding. And because I'm always doing real thin car bodywork stuff, I've gone for the 0.6 because I've got less chance of um, burning big holes with it. I've got more chance of uh, joining thin, thin bits of metal together. When you have, um, when you're swapping between 0.6 and 0.8, oops, didn't mean to do that. You'll have um, that roller hopefully you can see that has two grooves in it one groove is set for the 0.8 wire and one is set for the 0.6 and you want whatever wire you want the corresponding groove so this is stamped 0 0.8 0 0.8 being this side meaning that groove which is bigger than the other side which is 0 0.6 and it says 0 0.6 stamped on it that side as well this one actually has all the little instructions on here um, <clears throat> so hopefully with your welding tool you get your instructions and all the rest of it the other thing to say about the preload or the clamping force you put on here is if you have it too hard like too clamped up the serrations the little grippy serrations in here will bite into your mig wire so this is a bit i was fanning about with earlier and i was testing it can you see there You've got all those little indentations on the mig wire that's where that has been clamped so hard as I was playing around that it's crushed it. The, I mean, there isn't really a problem with that other than you wear the teeth out, but 
you've got to remember that if you're not using your MIG welder all the time um, and you've crushed it like that you will have damaged the protective coating that's on the wire so it all comes covered in this shiny coppery stuff but if you leave your welder in a wet damp shitty garage like mine for you know a couple of months you can start to rust all of this and if you've taken away the protective coating because you've had that clamped up too tight the rust will develop on the wire that's bad for two reasons reason number one is obviously you're trying to weld with something that's rusty which isn't going to work very well it'll just be introducing crap as you're welding which you otherwise wouldn't have had had you kept that nice and protected the other problem is if you have ru uh, rusty mig wire it goes up through into the harness and the harness sheath which should be all nice and clean and shiny new gets embedded with crap and rust which again means that it'll drag in certain places and um, lead to impure improper welds because um, the delivery of the wire will again be inconsistent and as I said before you're always looking for consistency in welding or at least the delivery of the wire all the stuff you can control like cleanliness the nice MIG wire nice feed speed consistent feed speed all of that stuff if you can get that right then it's just one less thing to go wrong um, that is the other important point with harnesses don't tread on them like you can stamp on the earth connector you can stamp on all your wires for your drills and that but don't tread on your harness because if you crease that again it will um, bits of it won't um, deliver the wire as consistently as had you not stamped on it they're not particularly expensive but it's just another thing to buy if you do end up damaging it when you're welding if you have your harness looped through a tight curve like that or doing an S going back on itself or around your leg or whatever it's your, your little motor is fighting against the curvature of the harness so when you can you want that laid out as neatly and nicely and as nice a predictable gentle curve as you can again it'll just mean that the wire comes up the harness nicely and that is coming out onto your surface ready to make a nice um, electrical arc at a consistent rate and you should be good welder settings all mig welders are different but you'll almost always have what i call power settings and then wire feed settings and the two need to be balanced so that you get the right kind of um, delivery of feed wire for the amount of current that you're actually using to create your arc on this welder you have the dial one two three and then the min and max buttons and it's not that you go one two three on minimum and then back to one and max you actually go one max, uh, minimum then the next stage high would be max then it would be two min two max three min three max so you've effectively got six power levels so that's power level one two three four five six the wire feed is just an incremental uh, rate at which that little motor drives your wire feed wheel i think it might also have something to do with current but i'm not 100 percent sure but the, th the the rough guide is the thicker the metal the more power you will need to create an arc strong enough to cause that metal to begin to melt and fuse together so on most car body stuff you'd probably be one max and about six on this welder but there's an awful lot of fine tuning to do depending on the actual thickness of the metal you're joining what kind of condition that metal's in the angle you're welding at um, and all kinds of subtleties like that and not only have you got these controls here but of course you've got you know, fundamentally how long you pull that trigger in a lot of the welding i've been doing on that car i've been it's not been seam welding it's been building up tacks but doing them quickly 
after each other that it's still going into a sort of a hot area of metal if that makes sense but um, I'll just show you a quick demo on what each of these power settings actually looks like on a sheet of 1.2 I think it is or one mil steel but you should get an idea of what I'm banging on about one min and I'll set it to about five and I'll try and do a seam and again I'll be pushing the world ahead of me which is how you're supposed to weld because you're pushing the shielding gas onto the bit you're just about to weld I think in a video yesterday I suggested why I don't do that a lot of the time um, but we'll discuss that later So that is me pulling the trigger and just pushing it along. That is not a great world because it's what I would call a cold world. It's sitting on top of the parent metal, it hasn't really sunk in. <clears throat> so that would tell me for the gauge of the steel I'm welding, I probably want more power to get more penetration so that this is actually fusing into the parent metal, not just sitting on top of it. The way you can combat this on a flat sheet of steel is actually to spread the weld out as you go, like so. So I haven't adjusted the welding setting, but I'm just gonna create the weld and sort of lap it over a wider area. And because the weld and the arc has been in the same area putting more material down um, even though the settings are the same there's been more heat in there for longer and the weld has sort of made a larger molten pool and sunk down a bit you can't do that pretty much on any car body steel without causing warping because you're just putting so much heat into a small area of metal which is why you'll see me do plug weld uh, sorry like sequences of tack welds to effectively stitch weld stuff together. Because I'm breaking the arc, the time for which current is actually being put in there is lower, you're less likely to cause warping. If I had done that on, let's say, a butt weld on a car wing, I would have warped it to hell. That's why when I, if you, if you have been watching the videos, when I put that uh, wheel arch section in dotty, I did like a tack and a tack, and then I went somewhere else on the wing and did a tack and a tack, and I did that progressively for about 20 minutes until I had the whole thing done. The thicker the metal, the more likely you're going to get away with doing um, a lot of welding in any one area. But chances are you'll have to be damn careful on any car bodywork not to warp it anyway so that's on our lowest setting and just for a comparison i'm going to crank it up to the next stage so i'm now going to go one max and i'm going to turn the wire feed up a little bit just because i've got so much weld uh, power that it would probably just want to burn through the wire that's coming out and before the next bit of wire got to the surface um, it would have just gone into the uh, environment. So you can see very slightly when compared with our first world it's you know marginally hotter and it's sat down a little bit deeper into the surface. I'm going to show you what happens now if you have your wire speed too slow or too fast so all the same settings again but I'm going to turn the wire feed right down and what will happen is because the wire is coming out too slow it'll be arcing 
and then that bit will burn away and drop off. And then the next bit will come out off and make a weld and then burn back into the gun and drop off and it will probably go like bzzzed, 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 even though I'm holding the trigger down the whole time. So I don't know how that's showing up on the camera. If I've even aimed it at the right place, I'll do it again. So I can see through the goggles that actually what's happening is I'm getting individual balls of weld like that forming on the tip of the wire because it's making contact with the surface. The, the, the circuit is being completed it arcs and burns the wire back up into the gun, breaking the arc, and then the whole process has to start again as the next bit of wire gets delivered to the surface. So I'm gonna progressively turn the wire speed up as I go, and you can see what happens. So we're about sounding nice, that people talk about um, the sound of frying eggs. You basically want a really consistent kind of crackling sound. Like that. I'm gonna go higher than that now and you'll see what happens. Basically the wire gets pushed out of the gun so fast that it begins to deflect off the surface and bend away and um, you get a slightly different noise altogether. So I'll try and do this one-handed again. Oh, and just for reference, if anyone has this world or think, thinking of getting it, we're on one max, just a Nats cock over six. So you can see we've had the opposite problem. We've been delivering so much wire that it's, the power coming from the arc isn't sufficient to cause it to melt and fuse and burn in fast enough. So it's just the wire is actually deflecting off the surface and we're getting a really inconsistent spattery weld. In fact, it's not welding it at all. Can you see how these blobs are barely on there? They're just sitting on the surface, which is, you know, not what you want. Um, if this was thicker steel, all of these same effects would be happening, but at higher power settings. So what you do is, if you've got the luxury of having spare pieces of steel the right size, you can do this. You can have a play until you're happy that you've got the right kind of settings for the welding of um, the steel that you're going to be using. So this, I don't think that's what I had out here. I think I was just probably showing a friend um, a little bit about welding. But when I started out, I would always have a little bit of scrap just to play around with. But if we go back to, oh yeah, incidentally, as that video was made, I, re I wound that right up to 10. So we're gonna go back to about Nat's cock over six and um, just have another little bit of a play. Handy to always have a little pair of wire cutters, side cutters, or a pair of pliers with the side cuttery bit in it, because you'll in it invariably do what I do quite regularly, which is forget to clip the earth clamp on, and then try welding. And of course, because you haven't got the clamp, there's no completed circuit, and it just does that, and then you think, oh, what a dickhead. I should have remembered to clip my earth on. People talk about the amount of wire you want poking out, and I usually go for about 10 mil maybe. It doesn't really make that much difference, I find, because you once you get the knack of it, you just top quite quickly. But yeah, I have about 10 mil like that. And I start with the um, trigger, or the, the, the end of the, the weld are quite close to the workpiece, probably a lot closer than some people would. 
but it's because I'm welding thin body metal and I want it that close to make sure that the shielding gas gets delivered to the right place. And I'm usually very precise about where I'm actually aiming the wire because when you're welding into a plug weld hole, that can make a huge difference as to where the arc initially strikes onto. Um, I'm going to do some demonstrations of plug welding later, in which I'll go into that in a bit more detail. What I've done there is a little seam weld and some spot welds, or like, you know, stitch welds effectively. If you have thick metal, you can pretty much always get away with doing this. If you have thin metal, you can't. And as I said before, doing it that way, you put less heat into the area. You still get effectively a seam. Because you've welded quite quickly onto the other one, there's no impurities in that area. It just It's a, just a way of managing heat. You can also leave the welds a little bit of a while, like tacking, and you can still weld onto it and it will be fine. Like so. Um, it just means you can put in a long panel and not have to um, warp it basically. The one thing that almost always happens when you start out welding thin body stuff is burning holes and that's basically because you've had the wire speed and power settings too high for the thickness of the metal. So if we go to let's say two max which is four steps out of six on this welder and I hold the trigger on there for too long actually this is whoa, Jesus that's hot yeah this is one mil steel so uh, 1.2 so it hasn't actually burnt a hole so I have to go even hotter <coughs> That's an extreme example, but basically the mold, the weld pool gets so big that gravity alone and the force of the weld just blows a big hole. Um, you will get that on thin metal at lower weld settings, particularly when you're at the edges of something. So if I go back <coughs> to a more sensible setting and try and weld that up. So let's say I was welding in here or going that way, it might just burn a big hole. Like so. You'll get around that problem by instead just doing tack welds together. <coughs> So not only does it prevent warping, but it stops you burning big holes. So I can pretty much guarantee I can weld that up with the same power settings, but just not by holding the trigger down for that one. Now that's a crazy high power setting to use to butt weld essentially one mil steel, but you can do it if you do it as like a, a pulse rather than a stitch or, you know, consistent seam weld. Holes like this aren't the end of the world. You can still fill them up and great thing is it's metal so you can just chop it out and start again if you want. If I turn the welder back down to something a bit more sensible, 
so we're on now one max and about five and a half wire speed. You can fill these holes up. Like so, it's not ideal, you have a lot more grinding to do, but if you do have the problem of blowing a big hole in something, you can generally fix it. If you're welding something and it's disappearing to dust every single time, it's probably because it's rotten on the backside and you just didn't realise it. Um, I'm going to go and get some real thin metal now, because this has been either 1.2, 18 gauges it, or 16, I don't know quite thick stuff but I'm going to go do some demonstrations on some really thin stuff now more like what you'd be using on a car wing. I've just come into the house and done a bit more reading on the power settings because I was um, preaching away and telling you what I thought and it turns out I'm right on the actual power settings but I know there's been a lot of confusion. This is on the MIG welding forum and there are people talking about those Clark MIG welters and asking the question, is the progressive increase one min to one max, then two min to two max, three min, three max, which is how I described it on mine. The first reply you get is somebody saying, no, it goes one min, two min, three min, one max, two max, three max. And I think the confusion is that some of the welders are different in the way the transformers are wired up. So mine works in that first way. And then somebody else has gone through and actually, um, corrected the manual that comes with the welder because some of the welder manuals aren't consistent either which is, uh, is bizarre really when you think about it but certainly in this one it will give you um ignore 0.8 gas welding but this table here kind of tells you the voltages you're getting for the different incremental increases in the power settings and then the corresponding wire speed adjustments so it's saying one min, one max, two min, two max, three min, three max, and the corresponding increases in voltage as measured at the workpiece. And then the corresponding wire speed settings. So when I was on two min, I was a Nats cock over six, which is about right, they're saying six in here. So it's good to know that as well as playing around yourself, you can always read the manual. It turns out I probably never read the manual and I was just making it up as I go along. But um, yeah, this place, MIG Welding Forum, is brilliant. Um, when I first started doing welding, that is where I learnt most. There's some really good um, MIG welding tutorials, MIG welding techniques, like plug welding and stuff. So as well as me trying to explain it, I would definitely recommend that you have a flick through on here. And then if you do have problems, there's the forum so you can log into this and all of this stuff here and ask questions. This is where I actually bought my MIG welder from. I bought it from a guy called Weld Equip who posts up on here quite regularly and I think he has a shop. So um, feel free to contact him. Obviously I'm not sponsored. I have no affiliation with any of this stuff. I'm just doing what I usually do, telling you what I use, how I use it, why I use it. Oh, there he is, look world equip so my world are oh my god we certainly want one of them mm -mm -mm. sexy purple one nice huh. doesn't look like he sells it anymore well anyway um that was the guy and that was the company I was going to do some more welding on that wing there, save ruining any more sheets of Zintec steel. What I've done is just clean the paint off and then I'm going to do some of the demonstrations I did earlier, but actually on thinner car body metal, more representative of the type of stuff I've been welding in the past. And if you're watching these videos and you're interested in um, working on cars, 
more like what you're going to be experiencing. So I'll now set up the camera and think about some logical sort of tests and demonstrations of the stuff I normally get up to um, with a bit of a how-to along the way as well. I thought I'd start off again just with the power settings. So right from minimum up to maximum and I'm going to do them in very different parts of the panel so you know that if anything's going on here it's to do with the heat that I put into that area and not the world I've just done previously if that makes sense. So one min a kind of semi-appropriate wire speed from my judgment before um, I actually start welding it's a little bit over five on this particular welder and we'll just run a seam and then I'll do on the other side a little row of spot welds not spot welds but you know a, a seam made up of individual blobs of weld rather than one continuous seam so I'm making and breaking with the trigger my world so first off a little seam along or up there and then I'll do a spot 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 this is all on minimum setting straight away got a nice weld but I can see from my eye and it might not be apparent to you but I've already started getting some sort of very slight heat distortion and that is just the fact that this is probably about 0.8 steel 0.8 mil so about the same length of weld but done with about half as much current actually going into the metal you'll know when you first start doing this your first weld because all of this area is effectively cold just sits flush on the surface if we turn the panel over you'll see how the penetration compares so that obviously is our seam and that is our row of stitches you actually end up getting about the same amount of penetration which is quite reassuring because you know that if you've done this on your car regardless of whether you seamed it or did a little row of little stitches like that it's um, penetrated through the full thickness of the metal so that's on absolute minimum power setting and we're actually getting decent penetration on this ultra thin metal which is about i think 0.8 but it could be smaller um, it's certainly not structural this is just an external skin panel so we're going to use the next setting up on the welder which will be one max and I'm going to increase the wire speed an absolutely tiny amount and we are talking very fine changes sometimes when people are setting up welders they get frustrated because it's not going to plan and it might be because they're just going a bit too high or low on this because it's really very sensitive indeed so we're on our two stages out of six in terms of power settings I'm just going to do exactly the same again so straight away I don't know whether you can see that but I can it's starting to get more warping in the panel you've got more penetration on the back just slightly particularly on the seam weld not so much difference on the stitch weld but gravity is taking the weight of that weld pull down and through I'm now going to crank it up again so we're now on two min and just about six this is the kind of setting that I'd be ordinarily using for welding 1.2 um, mil steel like so for the sills and other bits this is where I'm starting to worry about 
blowing a big hole while I do the seam. Oh, sorry, the um, yeah, the long length of weld. And I, if it does blow a hole through, I'm just going to let it do it because I want to see, and you probably want to see what the difference is if had I done the stitching. Right, so you can see how <laughs> it blew a massive hole. You've got a big divot there, a big indentation where you've got the heat warping. Did you see the whole bit of steel has sunk in and dropped away like so. Now I'm going to do this kind of stitched thing over about the same length. So massive heat distortion, but you haven't actually blown a hole. And yet you will have still ended up with a completely uniform bead of weld effectively. So that's why, reason number one, that when you see me doing my welding on Dotty, I'm doing that kind of a weld rather than stitch and seam welds. It re reduces distortion, prevents blowing holes, and yet still leaves a decent penetrated weld. There's no point me showing you higher welder settings on this because it would just be thoroughly inappropriate. You could have probably welded the panel just as well with the absolutely lowest power settings as you could with that middle one. I would always go for the absolute minimum weld power that gives you the requisite penetration that you need to join the panels. This has all been just on one surface. We're not actually joining anything here, more just demonstrating the difference in power settings and welding techniques. Next, I'm gonna go find some old scrap bits and actually show you some lap welds on here. And again, how the different uh, welder settings and techniques um, how they work on that kind of uh, piece of metal.